Good, good morning, everyone, to our inaugural West Coast Mad Scientist Conference. Uh, you know, and my brain is, has been racing all morning because I'm still on East Coast time. Uh, so at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, I was up on Twitter uh, talking about the conference and actually in a great conversation with the DARPA version in the Finnish military. And yes, we have mad scientists part of this community of action, which now every one of you here are a member of, and I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, their discussion this morning, in, and I, because it's in Finnish, I can't tell you the real name, but it's their DARPA, basically. Uh, their discussion this morning was absolutely central to what we're about to do for the next two days. And that is about humanity and warfare and what's the role of humans in future conflict. And they had a lot of arguments back and forth of, where, of what it meant for humans in uh, this human endeavor that takes place, good, bad, or indifferent, in warfare. And they're all, the, their scientists were all over the place. You know, one of them was discussing how since the past, since a uh, long back, everything that was developed was developed with the human in mind with human factors and everything about that. And another one was talking about the role of human judgment and how critical that was and how uh, other aspects of science were, were not gonna be able to overcome what human judgment uh, is able to do. And, uh, and probably uh, none of them uh, were right and none of them were wrong, uh, but they were having a great discussion at four o'clock Pacific Standard Time in whatever time it was in Finland. Uh, so I watched them have this conversation and I thought about, well, this is a great way to talk about this conference because why, why bioconvergence? What are we about to do for the next two days? Uh, in our past mad scientist conferences, over and over and over again, we, we've done Georgia Tech, AI Robotics and Autonomy. We've done mega cities at Arizona State. It always comes back to what are soldiers doing from an Army perspective, but what are service members doing on future battlefields? And it always came back to humanity and what were humans going to be able to do on the future battlefield. Uh, uh, the president of Arizona State University, um, uh, Mr. Crow, I believe was his name, uh, he talked about homo sapiens.net. And later today, you'll hear about things like uh, the human 2.0. So we felt like we needed to spend in Mad Scientist a couple of days of bringing some of the best minds together in this topic and let's get into bioconvergence and let's try to think about what does it mean about being a human in conflict in the, in the future. And that's really what we're getting at here. So I wanted to uh, you know, bring us around to uh, what the outcome here of this it all is. So how are we going to do this? Here's some rules in the road. I don't really like rules, uh, but we have to have a few rules. Uh, so, so this everything's unclassified. We have all kinds of people in this room. You know, I encourage you that if you want to talk at a different level, your job here is to network. Gets down to the one of the bottom pieces to new, meet meet new people and have the conversations you need to have outside of this environment. But this is an unclassified environment. Everything except for in two cases is live streamed. We have an incredible community from all over the world live streaming. We have a moderated chat room. All of that's ongoing behind the scenes. Uh, our timing is tight. We're trying to do something a little bit different here, which was to have our presenters uh, lay out what their, you know, their presentation, have questions, and let you to follow on uh, after that. Um, the microphones, if you're up front, uh, Paul Spinato, who's somewhere in the back, if you have a question, we'll bring you a microphone. If you have a question, anyone else, there's a microphone on the left and right. You'll see them in the aisle. Just move to, the, uh, move to that point. Ask one question, be succinct. Your homework. I know y'all love your homework emails that I've been sending you for a, for a month. You do have homework here. One piece is introduce yourself to at least 10 people, and the other piece is check out the game that we're playing through uh, ICT, the Institute for Creative Technologies. There's a booth out in the lobby if you want to know more, but that game, you can play the game if you're here, if you're connected virtually, or if you're not even connected with the conference, you can play this game and you can crowdsource your ideas on biology. Okay, but really what this all gets to is you're now part of a community of action. And our community of action in Mad Scientist is about making our teams future ready. I just saw Jamie Canton come in, who was one of our presenters, and a huge, huge thing that Jamie taught us was, 
hey, we need to be future ready. A lot of us think of it in the terms of current readiness. We need to be future readiness. Future readiness is about its anticipation, and this is all about anticipation. So play the game and get connected. So these are all the ways you can get connected. You've got a card out there. If you're online out there, you know, get connected. Follow up afterwards. If you're tweeting, that's great. At Trade Act, at Army, uh, Matsa, at SRI, it'll jump up. It's dash INT behind that. Hashtag Matsa Bio. Feel free to communicate about what's going on here across the net. So I'm going to show you a video to fire everybody up. So a lot of people ask, this is great. Why, does, why is the trade, why is training and doctrine command in the Army? And more than that, why is the training and doctrine command G2 got so many brilliant people together to talk about biology. And it's really about what I just talked about, about being future ready. So Training and Doctrine Command and the TRADOC G2, uh, as part of that, is responsible for developing what we call the operational environment. And the operational environment are all the conditions that our soldiers need to be prepared to operate in the f uh, now and in the future. And that involves everything from our development of training, doctrine, our concept development, and our capability development. So this this video, I think, w gives purpose to what we're going to talk about for the next two days. So, a little movie to fire you up. With a worldwide mission in support of combatant commands, special operations forces, allies, and the Army's total force, TRADOX G2 is the Army proponent for the operational environment, or the OE. The OE is a composite of the conditions, circumstances, and influences that affect the employment of military forces and the decisions of a commander. The OE is the start point for building readiness, interoperability with allies, training, leader development, concept development, capability development, testing, and experimentation. TRADOX G2 is an enterprise of several specialized matrixed organizations that, when combined, produce an OE that is uniquely crafted in partnership with the Joint Staff, OSD, Sister Services, Intelligence Community, Academia, DOD Labs, Industry, Think Tanks, and Allies. This single Army OE narrative must withstand the most rigorous external scrutiny and must ensure the Army and our teammates arrive at future battlefields with the right training, equipment, doctrine, and capabilities. For readiness, training, and leader development, TRADOX G2 provides real-world scenarios for mission rehearsal exercises and translates the OE into the Decisive Action Training Environment, or DATE, for task proficiency training. DATE thinly veils real-world intelligence to create the conditions needed to train any task in the Army Universal Task List. The total force uses DATE at home station, at all combat training centers, and at every Army school from basic training and ROTC through all NCO training to include the SARP Majors Academy, all functional training like Ranger School, and all officer professional military education from basic officer leaders course through the Command and General Staff College. Our closest allies have formally adopted DATE to build interoperability through training. To ensure that DATE and the OE are employed in a uniformly effective manner, TRADOX G2 delivers tools and scenarios and accredits the use of DATE and the OE Army-wide. For example, the TRADOC G2 annually accredits the OE at the CTCs, ensuring operational forces are challenged by capabilities from potential adversaries. A common Army OE bridges the operational force and the institutional Army and creates ready land forces capable of winning on any future battlefield. As a matrixed organization, the same TRADOC G2 staff that understands, defines, delivers and assesses the OE and DATE for readiness, training, and leader development, also provides OE support for concept and capability development, testing, and experimentation. Success tomorrow begins today. TRADOC G2 has unique capabilities that, when matrixed together, provide the Army's start point to understand the changing character of the future of warfare. TRADOC G2 delivers the OE for studies, defense planning scenarios, Army and Joint Tabletop Exercises, 
equipment tests, and experiments. G2 programs like the Mad Scientist Initiative partner with world-class academics, the IC, other government agencies and allies to study the cutting edge of science and technology like AI, autonomy, robotics, cyber, neuroscience, and biotechnologies. This broad partnering and crowdsourcing methodology brings the Army a peer-reviewed vision of future warfare. Today's lieutenants and junior soldiers will be the Army's senior leaders of 2050 and will use the TRADOC G2's OE throughout their careers. The OE connects soldiers and leaders to today's fight, tomorrow's fight, and the fight after next. Victory starts here at TRADOC. And all TRADOC lines of effort start with the TRADOC G2's OE. So success tomorrow starts today. And that's about being future ready, and that's our purpose uh, for the next two days, is to make sure that uh, we get it as right as possible about what the future looks like and what bioconvergence could look like. So I'll be followed, I'm gonna bring up uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Suhan, who's gonna uh, talk real briefly about the game that we're running uh, so that you know you have the opportunity to contribute your ideas because uh, there's nobody here just to take in information. Everybody here in this community of action is all about participating in, uh, in what they think. So I'm Lieutenant Colonel Brian Suen. I'm the Director of Technology Wargaming out of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army Research and Technology Office. And one of the things we have developed is an online crowdsource wargaming effort. And the idea is to use the knowledge of the crowd to help us look into the future. Uh, for this event, we're, we partnered with the Mad Scientist and are looking at bioconvergence. To talk a little bit more about the actual game, I'm going to call up uh, Dr. Jason Augustin. Thanks, sir. Good morning. Uh, I'm still on East Coast time, as I suspect many of you are, so uh, bear, bear with me. Um, as as uh, Lieutenant Colonel Suhan said, we have the uh, uh, SciTech Futures crowdsourcing game up and running uh, is running now, uh, available for all of you to access. If you haven't already registered, uh, this, this is the website. Uh, the URL is futures.armysciTech.com. Uh, when you arrive at that page, you will see, in addition to this great video, uh, you will see a Play Now link. Uh, it may also say Register if you're not logged in. Uh, click that. You can fill out a registration form. Uh, we do not ask for uh, your bank account information or anything like that. We keep it, uh, keep it anonymous. And then you're ready to go. Uh, so that, this game uh, started, uh, I believe, on Monday, and it will run actually through the 16th. So we are eager for you to give us your ideas here. Uh, and, and I might actually add a bullet to, to, to Lee's slide. In addition to meeting 10 people, uh, we'd like you to each give us 10 good ideas, or 10, they could be bad ideas too, but 10 ideas uh, in, this, in this website. Um, when you, uh, once you register and you log in, there are kind of three main areas for you to play. You'll see links to those on the top of the screen. Uh, the workshop is where you'll probably spend most of your time. That's where you go to give us technology ideas. So if you have a thought, uh, someone speaks and you have an idea about a future technology that you want to contribute, you can do that in the workshop, fill out a short form, boom, it's in there for everyone to see and upvote up and comment upon, et cetera. Uh, if you have something that's not a technology idea but you think is important context, uh, maybe it's something cool you saw in a video game or, or, or a movie, or maybe it's a report that you think is really important, you can add those to the area called the Imaginarium. Uh, so think of that kind of like Pinterest. It's a place you can go to get some inspiration. Uh, as the ideas come in and get, and get uh, community traction, they will migrate to the marketplace, uh, which is where you can go, and every day you will have 10,000 imaginary dollars uh, to invest in ideas that you think are particularly promising. So those are all there. Uh, once you're in the site, it's, it's all fairly self-explanatory, but if you do have questions, um, in addition to myself and Lieutenant Colonel Suhan, we have a table set up in the lobby, uh, staffed by folks from ICT who can give you a demo. Uh, they can answer questions, et cetera. Uh, so that, that is the game, and again, we, we encourage you to play. Uh, in addition, you should have received when you registered 
a physical idea card, uh, a postcard. Uh, if you did not receive one, they're on the registration table. Uh, if for some reason you can't get into the game, uh, please fill those cards out and you can drop them off at the same table. Um, with that, I hope to see you all in the game. Thanks. So in, in typical community action way, we already had uh, somebody take a look at the game and said, that's great. The winners ought to be automatically pushed over to Kickstarter so you can get investors. And uh, so, so our, that's already a great idea. Uh, as, as, but I'm not sure some people want to invest in some of the things that are going to be here. But we'll see. It should be a, it should be a great game. Okay, our first uh, presenter today to talk about um, SRI and our great host here uh, in this facility, you know, SRI International. Um, we're right now, this is where if you've got an iPhone in your pocket and you like Siri, well, this is where she's from. Uh, if you like the mouse on your computer or don't like it, you can complain to, um, to William uh, Jeffrey uh, because this is where the mouse came from. Uh, and, and on and on and on. I believe the first email was sent from here. I mean, we're, you're at a truly historic location as far as uh, the science that, that, that defines what we, what we do today. A lot of it was developed here. So we're uh, lucky to be here, and we do appreciate it. Uh, but um, uh, Dr. Jeffrey is going to come forward. On the bios, all the bios are online. So just to speed us through, all I'm going to tell you about Dr. Jeffrey is he's the CEO here. And he has uh, incredible science and technology experience throughout our government, relationships with DARPA. He worked for the Bush administration. He's worked uh, for Boeing and R&D. Uh, so a lot of interaction with uh, bringing science and technology to the world that we live in. So, uh, sir, if you'll come forward, and uh, we appreciate uh, hosting us. That's really cool. This is going to be fun. So I love that game. So that's, uh, I'll try to give you at least uh, 10 bad ideas. So, hey, welcome to SRI. I, this, the next two days is going to be a lot of fun and hopefully also will have a lot of impact. Uh, this is an opportunity to really brainstorm and to really get the ideas out there and to help TRADOC and the Army, as they say, to prepare for the future. So I would like to uh, extend a special welcome uh, to the Army leadership, including Brigadier General David Komar, Tom Greco, Richard Kidd, Brent Parmeter, and Phil Picante, an old friend. Welcome back, Phil. As we said, for 70 years, SRI has sort of used its cadre of mad scientists to create disruptive technologies that have fundamentally changed our defense and our economy. You know, some of the ideas were mentioned. I'll add a few more. For example, this thing called the internet, that was ARPANET. We were right at the beginning of that. We were node two on that system. Shaky, which is the world's first autonomous robot with artificial intelligence, came out of SRI. The first surgical assistant robot the intrusion detection systems for cybersecurity, and on and on and on, all of these things that really help change the world. And so this is something that we're very, very proud of, and so we feel very, very comfortable in helping to co-host the Mad Scientist Conference. We think this fits right in with our basic culture and psyche. And we also very much welcome our collaborators from industry and academia and the other services who have joined today in helping to support the TRADOC's mad scientists. So to get you in the mood for this conference, I want you to sort of think about some examples from science fiction or others that were transformative. And so as a little example, how many people have either read or seen Ender's Game by Orson Scarcart? Almost everybody, that's great. That is a great example of how combining neurotechnology and artificial intelligence with human creativity, and that was mentioned as, as well this morning, absolutely essential to leverage the human creativity, but then use the neuro interfaces, the machine learning, and others to amplify its effectiveness 
and to actually be able to manage a very, very complex command and control system. Or my favorite, actually, science fiction is the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov, where now you employed social science to actually uh, predict large-scale behavioral dynamics and actually influence the direction of whole societies. Now, at the time, that seemed very, very far-fetched. It may not seem so far-fetched anymore today. Now, add advances from quantum Think about the kinds of changes that can occur when we can fundamentally break some of the classical physics paradigms in intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance systems, or in generating secure key exchanges, or in creating chip scale clocks and IMUs and sensors. And when you start to combine all of these things, you can start to see a world that will look very, very different from what we have today. So how radical will that world look? You know, part of this is looking out towards 2050, so 32 years in the future. One way to get an appreciation of how much of a shift that really can be is to look back 32 years, back to 1986. And what was the world like in 1986? Well, it turns out that the first computer to use the Intel 8386 was introduced that year. That had a whopping four kilobytes of memory. Pretty impressive. The first MS-DOS computer virus was seen in the wild. That put us on a whole different path. And in terms of biology, that was the year that the Human Genome Project started. So think of how much we've advanced in that time frame. But sadly, that was also the year that the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded right after launch. So who could have predicted how quickly computers, cybersecurity threats, and biology would have progressed? And quite frankly, as someone who's actually an astrophysicist trained, how actually slowly our human spaceflight capability would have progressed from that time period. So some things are really easy to predict, some things are really hard. And obviously, I think Yogi Berra said it best when he said it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So some things that I think is safe to predict, right? Technology changes rapid, we all know that. And the rate of change is accelerating. And it's becoming more and more global. 30 years from now, data is likely to be democratized, almost everyone will have access to huge amounts of data. Analysis and the generation of the information from that data will be nearly instantaneous. And military and technical surprise, therefore, will be almost impossible to maintain. So technology is creating new capabilities, but it's also creating new vulnerabilities. The complexity of the technology that's being created and the interconnection of all of these technologies is increasing, and understanding the emergent behavior and the risks that will come with that is going to be extremely challenging, if not absolutely intractable. So we also need to look at the changes that may be coming from a slightly different vantage point. It's not just some of the technology that may become disruptive, but new con-ops, new concepts of operations may be just as disruptive using existing technology. As an example, think back to precision guided munitions. Much of that technology was well in existence. It was the use of the technology in a new way that completely transformed the way, the effectiveness of the military operation. So adversaries, whether they have the best technology or not, will exploit new con ops as well, at, at, probably at a very much an increasing rate to create asymmetric advantages. Now, biology is one area where the rapid pace of discovery is opening up really exciting possibilities, but quite frankly, also really scary vulnerabilities. Our ability to manipulate the very essence of living organisms is outstripping our ethical understanding, our ability to surveil, or our countermeasures. This is certainly one area 
uh, where I think the MAD Scientists Conference can explore the possibilities and implications and really help advance that. So extrapolating today's trends is fraught with peril and imagining the impact of things that are still in the laboratory is really difficult. Yet we need to be prepared and we need to find a way to use technology to reduce our vulnerabilities while increasing the risk on our adversaries. So as such, I'd like to acknowledge and thank TRADOC for having the foresight and the vision to host such an event. This is truly an amazing conference. So this should be intellectually stimulating and an important discussion today. So welcome for attending. Look forward to all of the great ideas. And I'm definitely going to go sign up for that game. So good job. And I would now like to turn it over to Peter Kant, who's the SRI VP for Federal Partnerships. Oh, wait. We got something for you. Oh. So yeah, before you go. Huh. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom Greco. I'm the G2 of Training and Doctrine Command. And as Lee mentioned, our mission is whether the Army has a mission tonight, 2030, or 2050, we identify the conditions that the Army is and our allies are going to face. That's what we do. What we're for is to bring the intellectual capabilities of the nation to bear on the Army's next mission. And one of the ways we do that is mad scientists, the mad scientist program. And you're, as exactly as you say, uh, looking at the trends and looking at technology and its effect on the changing character of warfare. If you think about it, technology has always had a decisive influence on the manner in which nations or peoples have advanced their objectives. The Romans, tremendous engineers, they built roads and bridges, many of which still exist today. The British, had, a, in the time of sail, used their navy to advance the empire which, on, upon which the sun never set. In recent history, the arsenal of democracy in industrial age warfare, we were able to defeat fascism around the world. So as we look at that as a trend, looking back, as we look forward, it is absolutely important Silicon Valley is, is the heart, the soul, the mind of America's future. And America's interests are advanced by this incubator of innovation, which is Silicon Valley. And SRI is the epitome of that incubator. And, and so, with that, people often ask me, so how does one become a mad scientist? And you, and you don't become a mad scientist. You are actually proclaimed. So do we have... <laughs> Do we have the proclamation? <laughs> proclamation, United States Army Training and Doctrine Command, Deputy Chief of Staff Intelligence, MAD Scientist. Whereas the MAD Scientist Initiative encourages continuous dialogue and collaboration among academia, industry, government, and non-traditional partners. And whereas the MAD Scientist Initiative identifies tomorrow's key innovators today so the U.S. Army is successful in future operational environment. And whereas the Mad Scientist Initiative supports Army learning and capability development. And whereas Dr. William A. Jeffrey has provided a great and valuable insights and contributions to furthering the mission, goals, and understanding of the Mad Scientist Initiative. Now, therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in me as a TRADOC Deputy Chief of Staff Intelligence, that's not me, that's... <laughs> Mr. Greco, <laughs> uh, I do hereby proclaim that Dr. William A. Jeffrey be known henceforth and forevermore as an official mad scientist with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. May you always seek the future boldly, actively question conventional wisdom and assumptions, and passionately challenge the status quo. It witness whereof I hereunto set my hand this 8th day of March 2018. Thomas Greco. Awesome. So, and that'll be the only, we'll, we'll give these certificates out, but that'll be the only time we'll actually have a dramatic reading. I did want to say, I did want to say thank you very much. And also, uh, we have uh, the Tradoc G2 coin, and on the back side of it is our Mad Scientist logo. So thank you. Oh, that is thank so you very cool. much. Thank you so much.
And I've just got to say that if my team ever doubted that I was absolutely mad, I've got proof. <laughs> Thank you.